And I thank God that he allowed me to wash a mantle that be able to transfer from me to my son. He said from generation to generation. It's either going to be generational curses or it's going to be generational blessings. Well, I get the privilege to see a generational blessing. I get to see my son rise up in the position of a minister. That he said when he was seven years old, I want to be a preacher like you, Dad, when I grow up. And I said, that's the Holy Ghost because I prophesied over my children when they were little. And I said that my daughter Tiffany here, she's going to be my missionary. I told Sean when he told me that, I said, Sean, I said, that's the Holy Ghost thing you just said there. Because God told me you were going to be my pastor. I said, my, your sister Misty is going to be my evangelist. We can get in agreement with that. She's going to be an evangelist when she gets fired up. And we can talk about Sean. He was my pastor. Tiffany married a boy from England. She's already got the mission trips going. Goes back and forth to England. So praise God. Listen, do not look at your kids through their mistakes or shortcomings. Look at them through the heritage of the Lord. When you took that covenant blood down, you drank it, bam. God set something to order. And so, you know, it gives me great privilege to invite my son up here to take the pulpit. Praise God. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. And you children now, y'all can go. <laughs> Praise God. Can y'all hear me? Awesome. Uh, give them a chance to get to their class real quick. Praise God. Let's pray real quick. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting my words be your words, Father God. Let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Thank you for this opportunity to bring forth something that you birthed in me, Father God. And that, Lord, just let it be something that every person in this room can take something out of, Father God. Because, again, it's from you. So we praise you for this day and for everything that you're doing in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory and honor. Amen. Amen. I just want to thank you know, Pastor James and Debbie. Obviously, they're mom and dad to me, but to y'all, they're Pastor James and Debbie. I want to thank them so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you all today and, and kind of share something that God laid on my heart a few months ago. About four months ago, my wife, my best friend, and his wife got the opportunity to go and hear another friend perform with a band in a worship concert. It's really what it was. It was a worship band going out on a mission for God to worship for God. And we went, we listened to this night of worship, and it was such a powerful night of worship. I mean, you could feel the presence of God in this church that we were in so powerfully. It was just such an amazing night of worship. And, you know, lives I'm sure were changed and left out of there. And you know how when the power of God hits a place, it doesn't just, it's not just that night. You leave with something for the next day and the days ahead and so forth. So, you know what? We left out that night after worshiping God in such a powerful, awesome way that the next day, you know, God carried me through the day. I had an awesome Monday. Tuesday rolled around. Now, Tuesday was a little different. Great start to my morning. I work afternoons at where I work. So afternoon didn't start out so great. Kind of a rough start to my day at work. Kind of mellowed out in the middle. I work eight hours like most people. Finished on a sour note as well. Well, I'm a very analytical person. Anyone like, knows my dad, I'm a thinker like him. You know, I, I do a lot of thinking. I think about everything that goes on in my life a lot sometimes, unfortunately, to my you know, disservice. And then next morning, I'm on my way to work, and it just hits me. And John 19, or excuse me, John 16, 33, Jesus said, fear not, for I've overcome the world. And I'm like, wait, I'm struggling to overcome this Tuesday. And Jesus said in his word, I've overcome the world. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I'm struggling to overcome Tuesday. And he's, he who lives within me overcame the world. And so, you know, moved on to the next weekend. Service was great at church. Um, again, Monday was another good day. Here comes Tuesday again. Get a call early in the morning. Just, you know, started my day off bad. Didn't help my day at work. Another bad day. And it's like, wait a minute, what is this deal? I'm struggling to overcome a Tuesday in my work week when Jesus lives on the inside of me and he's overcome the world. Well, what is a Tuesday? We know Literally, Tuesday is the third, what, second day on our calendar, third day if you're a Jewish person on their calendar. But what is a Tuesday? A Tuesday, figuratively speaking, is a night 
or day that follows a time of power and glory that God has blessed you or you've had an intense moment in his presence where the world and the devil is coming at you with everything full force that they can throw at you to get you off of what God has planted in you. And Jesus even said in Matthew 13, 19, the enemy is going to come to steal that seed because if he can steal a seed, if you've ever been done any kind of farming, any kind of planting, you know a seed in its basic form is easy up to, to uproot. Once it takes root, if, you, if you've done any kind of planting of any plant, farming, anything, you know once it's taken root, that plant is a lot more difficult to get uprooted. It's a lot more difficult to take it up from where it's at. Well, likewise with the Word of God. When it's taken root in your heart, it's a lot more difficult for the devil to take it out Amen. than when it's still in that seed form. So if he can take it out as soon as you hear, as soon as you leave today, and this Word's been planted in your heart, okay, he got it still in seed form. You meditate on this, you read over God's Word, these scriptures that you know, I'm sharing with you, then it's a little more difficult for him to take out what God gave you and what God put in your heart. I want to take a few, I want to look at a few examples in the Word of God of some men of God who faced a, again, as I'm calling it, a Tuesday. Let's flip over to 1 Kings 18, verses 21 through 40. Now, if they want to put it up there, that's fine. Um, Y'all go ahead and flip it, flip to it in your Bibles. I might kind of paraphrase it because it's kind of a long story, but one most of us are pretty familiar with. Let me know when you guys are there, if y'all are turning there. Here we see Elijah. Now, we know Elijah is a powerful man of God. He's a prophet of God. God used to do great and mighty things for his name in that time. Well, Elijah comes to the people, and at this time they're struggling between God and Baal. And Elijah tells them, how long will you... You know, struggle between two opinions. How long will we be between two opinions? And they're like, well, you know. So Elijah says, you know what? We're going to have a test. We're going to prove which God is real. Who's the real God? So he says, okay, you prophets of Baal, you 400 or so prophets of Baal, y'all build an altar to your God. And, you know, I'm going to build an altar to the Almighty God. And whichever God answers by fire, that's going to prove who's the real God. So the prophets of Baal, they build their altar they sacrifice the animal. They lay it on the altar. They're praying. They're shouting, actually. They're, I'm sure, dancing around, doing all their religious jig, trying to get Baal to answer them. Nothing happens. Elijah even said, starts shouting out and saying, shout louder. Maybe, that, maybe your God will hear you then. You know, come on, you fools, basically. Let's see if your God will hear you. Finally, he gives them like the whole afternoon to do this. All right, fine, nothing. And he says, okay, I'm going to sit at my altar. He sacrifices the bull, lays it on there, even digs a ditch around the altar. Now, I'm sure some of the people are looking at him like, why are you digging a ditch around your altar? He then calls them to bring buckets of water. Pour the buckets of water over the altar. Now, if you've ever been camping, hunting, ever just had a bonfire, what's world number one with wet wood? Yeah. It's not going to burn, right? Okay, again, the whole example of this is whichever God answers by fire is the real God. So again, okay, we wet the wood, we wet the whole thing, got a little ditch around it, filled water. Elijah prays. Fire comes down from heaven, burns up the sacrifice, burns up the whole altar, even dehydrates all the water in the ditch. Okay? The people immediately repent. They turn and say, God, you're God. You know, how could we have been so crazy, so silly to you know, serve this other God? Elijah has them kill all the prophets of Baal. He says, okay, my God's God. We're going to kill all these prophets. Well, okay, the people have turned to him. Word gets back to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Jezebel's not too happy that her prophets have just been killed. Because, again, she's following Baal. Her prophets have just been murdered by this other prophet. Okay, Jezebel hears about this. She threatens Elijah's life. He just killed 400 prophets of Baal, called fire from heaven, soaked up all the water, one woman threatens his life, and what does he do? He runs for the hills. <laughs> now, okay, you know, we've all heard the phrase, hell hath no fury like a woman's scorn. Well, one woman got scorned because all her prophets got killed. She threatens this man of God's life, and instead of standing his ground, he just had 400 men killed. One woman threatens him, and he takes off. So Elijah gets off. In fact, gets to a place where the angels come to minister to him, but he even asks God to take his own life. He is so threatened by this woman, so scared of this one woman, that he says, God, 
let me die. Does that make any sense to anybody? I'm like, okay, anyways. So he gets there, the angel starts feeding him, ministering to him, he's restored in his strength and in the power of God. What, did, what do we feed on? Figu we spoke figuratively of that, but literally, what do we feed on daily, spiritually speaking? The Word of God, right? Yeah. This is our spiritual food. We feed on this daily so that we can be empowered and strengthened in the might of God to go through our days. Even when the devil has come against you, tried to take you out, uproot that seed, everything, we feed on God's Word so that He can restore us in power and might, and that seed will grow, you take root, and we continue. So we looked at Elijah. Let's look at David. We know King David, God himself, called the man after my own heart. So we know David killed a lion, he killed a bear, he killed a giant. Well, what did he get out of the giant killing? He got the king's daughter as a wife, basically developed an intimate brotherly relationship with the king's son, and in fact called the, the king himself a father, considered Saul a fatherly figure. Well, we know Saul was originally anointed to be king. He kind of fell away, got off into some worldly stuff, started listening to soothsayers and all this other kind of stuff. Well, David's eventually anointed king. Well, David was a harpist, as we know. David would come and you know, perform for Saul in his chamber. So, you know, Saul gets kind of refreshed, the evil spirits leave him, whatever, because David's playing for him. And, you know, music sues the savage beast. Well, we'll consider Saul a savage beast at this point, because especially what he does after this. Saul finds out that David's been anointed king. He's still allowing him to play for him, still per perform in front of his presence. The women are singing his praises, you know. David kills his thousands, or Saul kills his thousands, David kills his tens of thousands. Well, Saul gets a little upset and eventually actually tries to spear David to the wall of the very chamber that they're in. So what does David do? David goes and runs off. Again, he's killed a lion, he's killed a bear, but now the man he considers like a father has just tried to kill him. So he runs off. He gets off into a cave that we know is the cave of Adullam and gets that time of peace, that time of rest. And in fact, Saul even comes hunting him down, trying to kill him. And David at one point has the opportunity to kill Saul, finds him out in front of the cave, cuts off a piece of his garment, and even says, my father, you know, I had the chance to kill you, but I honor the authority on your life more so than my own pride, my own desires. I couldn't kill you. I honor you too much. I honor the authority on your life. So it seems like even when those, anyone ever, don't, answer, don't raise your hands, this is a rhetorical question, but anyone ever had a family member try to take you out? Like someone you love, someone you admire, you look up to, not my family. My family doesn't do that, okay? Don't think anything crazy. Um, but try to take you out. And it seems like, why? Why would God allow my own family to come against me? So he says, you know, my father, why would you do this to me? And, you know, it was just, it's crazy, but David's in this cave. He's getting restored. He's getting refreshed. What's a, ca what's a cave to us? A cave to us is our prayer closet. Because why? We get away. We get in that solitude. We get... In the presence of God, we allow God to minister to us spirit to spirit in a way that only he can when we allow ourselves to get into that solitude, that isolated place. Yeah, so I mean, you got peace, you got joy because we got in the presence of God. Let's flip on over to Acts 16, verses 23 through 26. We're going to look at a couple of New Testament examples as well in this. Because we looked at Elijah, we looked at David, and what they've done to overcome these Tuesdays in their life. So, here in Acts 16, we're going to see many who we consider to be basically one of the founding people of the New Testament church. Paul. We have Paul and Silas here. Paul and Silas, what they've been doing, they've been, again, they've ta been taking the world for storm by, for God, I mean, set, set up churches everywhere they go, ministering, casting out demons. Well, here in Acts 16, we find these guys, again, they're shaking the whole world, the known world for God. Anyone ever have like a sibling when you're younger that would follow you around and copycat? They'd say everything you said. You'd say one thing, they'd repeat you, and they're following behind you. They're the little tag along, copying everything you say. Well, Paul and Silas kind of find a sort of copycat here in 1623. They're traveling along, 
They meet a demon-possessed slave girl who's following them, repeating everything they say. Well, okay, you got this girl following you around. Paul recognizes the demon on her. He, in fact, eventually cast out the demon from this girl who was a fortune teller. You know, she had bosses and she was making money for it. He casts out this demon. She goes back and tells her bosses. The bosses aren't too happy about it because they're like, wait a minute, there goes our income. You know, we just lost steady income from this girl who was telling people their fortune. They get all the officials together. They get the people of the city write it up. And basically, they come after Paul and Silas, and, they're, and they throw them in jail. And, you know, again, this is first century prison, basically. This isn't county lockup. This isn't Tech City P jail. You know, this ain't something nice where you get three square meals a day. This is, we're basically, there's things down there that you don't want to even think about, flowing by your feet and so forth and so on. You know, again, we're not going to mention all that. But they're in prison. And, you know, I don't know, i got to be honest. If I was in prison, I don't know that I could sit there and worship God, thanking him for what he's doing in my life, when I just got thrown into one of the nastiest prisons imaginable. Well, we find them about midnight, praising and worshiping God, singing praises to God. And what do we get? We get the original jailhouse rock. Because what? The chains start falling off, the doors swing open, the building's shaking. And okay, again, this is a first century prison. I, midnight, I don't know how well lit this thing is. I'm a jailer. I get waking up all this shaking and moving and everything. Doors are open. What does he do? The jailer freaks out, thinks, okay, tomorrow morning when my bosses show up to relieve me, whatever, it's my life because these, prisons, these prisoners have now escaped and ran off. He gets ready to take his own life. Sure, draws a sword, probably about to either cut his throat, stab himself, whatever. Paul and Silas yell out, no, no, wait, we're still here. Don't take your own life. Because they were willing to praise God in the midst of this storm that they were in, they not only saved themselves, they brought salvation to the jailer and his whole family because he takes them home that very night. Again, it's midnight, but he's like, come to my house at midnight, basically, and bring salvation to his whole household because these two men of God were willing to you know, sacrifice. Because I'm sorry, if I'm locked up against this stone wall, I'm probably not feeling too much about sacrificing to God, whether it's to my lips or what have you. So in the jail, they praise him. They sing praises to God. Well, okay, we've looked at three men of God. Did Jesus ever face any, as I've put it, Tuesdays in his life? Most certainly. Three examples I gave you, I, I likened them to three things. Elijah dealt with the world. David dealt with family. Paul and Silas dealt with the religious people. Because I'm sure there were some non-religious people that were involved, but mostly I think it was some religious people that threw him in jail. Jesus most certainly did. Let's flip to Luke 19.46. We're going to see an example here where Jesus most definitely faced the world. Now we know there's more examples, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just give you one or two. Jesus comes into the temple. You know, he's ready to worship God. He comes in and says, and he finds what's basically happened as the temple has been turned into a flea market. And I use our common vernacular. He says, my house shall be known as a house of prayer, but you've turned into a den of thieves. Why? Because they've got tables set up in the temple. They're selling stuff to the people in a place that was never meant for that to be happening. So, yes, Jesus faced the world because the worldly people come in and turn this temple into something it was never meant to be. Did he face family? Oh, yes, he did. Let's flip over to Matthew 12. We're going to look at verses 47 through 50 in Matthew 12. Wait, one page too far. Okay. Je Jesus is teaching some of the people. Mary and his, all of his siblings show up. One of the disciples hears about it and says, Jesus, your mother, your brothers are here. Jesus says, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? These that I'm ministering to are my mother and my brother and sisters. Okay, Mary knew from the conception that he was the son of God. So, okay, I can get Mary... She should understand, you know, this, my son is the son of God. Well, we know Jesus' brothers and sisters never fully accepted him. In fact, James, who wrote the book of James, never accepted Jesus until after he had resurrected and appeared to the 500 after his resurrection. 
Like he, ne he knew him as his brother, but he never knew him as the son of God. So it went until after Jesus' resurrection that we see that. And Mark 6, 4, let's flip over there really quickly. You know, again, just another Jesus talking about family. You know, Jesus, Jesus says a prophet is only honored anywhere but his hometown. Because why? Those most familiar with you typically aren't going to honor you as much because they knew you when you were five years old and you stumped your knee and you did that crazy little thing to your sister or whatever it was. But those who don't know your past are going to be the ones to honor you the most. <laughs> religious people. Did Jesus ever face the religious crowd? The Sadducees and Pharisees tried to take Jesus out every step of the way that they could until the fact they realized they couldn't take him out directly. What had to happen? They had to actually get one of his own disciples to betray him because they said, you know what, we tried everything we can to take this man out directly, and it ain't working. Let's see if we can get one of his followers to, to you know, hand him over to us, basically. Well, of course, as we know, Judas turned over Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and the rest of that part is history. I mean, you betrayed him to death. I don't, I don't know if I could do that, but, you know, looking at, again, these Tuesdays, for lack of a better terminology, is, I mean, how do we overcome a Tuesday in our own life? We know we're, we're overcome by the word, of the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Well, how do we get a testimony? Well, you know, believing in Jesus, having his word in our heart, most definitely helps us to overcome and have a testimony that we overcame something. His blood, yes, we, that was shed for our salvation. Number one, we overcome by hiding God's word in our heart. In fact, Jesus said, I, you know, no longer will I write my laws on tablets of stone, but now I'll write my laws on hearts of flesh. So hiding his word in our heart, again, that daily being in God's word, meditating, you know, just going over and over again until it becomes so you know, entrenched in our hearts that we can't help but speak it forth when situations come against us. Getting alone in our prayer closet, you know, getting on our face before God, getting, and I, I'm, I'll be honest, this is one of the things I struggle with the most is getting alone and on my face before God. Like, it's easy to pray, you know, I got a situation going on, whatever, pray, but actually getting down on my face before God, and, you know, just saying, God, I love you, I honor you, you know, you speak to me in a way like you never, only you can. But getting alone in that prayer closet and just allowing him to minister to us and praising him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Praising him with your natural, your natural voice, but praising him in spirit. You know, you're praising him in the spirit. Even when it feels like you're in the worst situation imaginable, praising him for not just what he's given us, because it's always easy to praise God for my house, my car, my wife, and those are awesome things to praise God for, especially my wife. But <laughs> praising him for who he is, because who is he? He's God Almighty. He's the maker of heaven and earth that gave his only begotten son for us so that we can have victory, that we can overcome the world and overcome any Tuesday, any, you know, whatever day tries to come against you that the devil's saying, you know, I got to get the seed out of these people. I got to get them uprooted from this house, from his word, you know, and whatever else that they're trying to root themselves in. Because if he can get you out of this church, out of whatever house you attend, then he knows you're easier to pray than if you're entrenched and rooted in the house of God. So, you know, this is closing. I just pray, Father God, thank you for these words that you've given me, that I've spoken, Lord God. I just thank you that let their ears be open to understand and receive what's been ministered this morning. And just thank you, Father God, for this opportunity you gave me to be a blessing to those around me, Father God. So we just praise you for it. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
something that I can just pray right now that God's going to move over everyone's life that's coming up here. Thank you, Father God, for this willing vessel, Lord God, that you're going to move in her life like never before. She not only roots herself in this church, but in your word, Father God, in time and prayer and communication with you. So, Father God, I just praise you for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my brother, Lord God, for him and his wife. Thank you that I know they're rooted in this church, Father God, as they continue just to seek you in your word and prayer time, Father God, that you're going to continue just to, you know, take them to a new level. You said we go from glory to glory and victory to victory and faith to faith, Father God. So we just praise you for just as they continue to be faithful, Lord God, that you're blessing them in every area, financially, you know, and their children, Father God. And just thank you, Father God. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Thank you for my sister, Father God. Thank you that... As a woman that's of faith, Lord God, who's rooted herself in this house, and that she's, you know, supporting her pastors, Father God, but the thing is she continues just to, you know, go in your word, Lord God, and seek you in spirit and truth and that prayer closet, Father God, I thank you that you're just going to continue to minister her, Lord God. You're going to re revive those areas that need to be revived, Father God, and just thank you for just resurrection power being on her life, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for this beautiful woman, Father God. Thank you, Lord God. I just she continues just to seek you, Lord God, in, in, in her closet, Father God, in the prayer closet, in your word, Father God. That you're gonna you give her the strength to move on, Lord God. That that seed's gonna be rooted in her life like never before, so that she's gonna be able to you know move forward, Lord God, to pass get a victory and move on to the next thing, Father God. Because you said we go from victory victory to victory, Father God. So he's praise you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for my brother, Father God. Thank you for this man of faith and wisdom, Father God. Thank you that he just continues to come, Lord God, and hear your word, priest, Lord God, and he continues to get into your word daily. Lord, that you're ministering to him in a new and fresh way, Father God. Thank you that fresh oil, Father God. Thank you that many, many years ahead, Father God, we thank you for it, Father, and we praise you for what you're doing. In this man's life, in Jesus' name. Thank you, my brother, Father God. Thank you for a strong young man, Father God, who's, you know, getting himself planted and rooted, Father God, so that 